I thought again that I was just going to kind of be able to do the same things. I wasn't going to have to adjust anything when it came to my CF care and I was going to be okay. But what changed? My activity. I was no longer doing sports every day after school. Um, I was no longer doing a treatment at night, every night, no matter what. When I would get home at four in the morning, the last thing I wanted to do before I passed out was a treatment. Uh, and, and I started just, just making the most horrible decisions when it came to my health. Um, and, and you can guess, do you think my lung function took a hit? My days in the hospital increase? The way I felt, did it become worse? Yes, on all accounts. Was it because of CF? Nope. No, my CF didn't change. My CF didn't know I moved out of my mom's house and said, oh, we're really gonna get him now. He's vulnerable. Let's really ratchet it up. Come on, cells, become worse. Mucus, stick harder. No, CF doesn't know when the situation changes just magically and decides to ramp it up a little bit to test you. I simply stopped working as hard. CF worked the same level. And my whole pediatric life, because of my mom's guidance and threats, I was able to work harder than CF. But when I moved out of the house, I started working not as hard as CF was working. It didn't change how hard he was working, she, whatever it is. Um, and I started to pay the price. I started to become sicker. I actually was the sick guy. Uh, I, for the first time in my life, I, I remember pretty vividly, it was around the age of 23, where I started to think about CF other times than just when I was doing my treatments or just when I was in the hospital. Because up to that point, again, I never, it was never on the forefront of my mind. It was just something I did, but then, man, I was living life a lot. Um, but then the sicker I became, now I actually started to think about CF. Uh, I started to pay attention to the news about CF. Um, I started to, uh, truthfully, I started to see myself as one of them. Uh, I started to see myself as a CF patient. Uh, and, um, you know, the sad part was I started to get sicker and sicker, but I was unwilling to make a change. And, and I think the biggest reason I was unwilling to make a change is because of this next trick, which I could go on about forever. And you say, it, you know, I, that sounds like I could go on about everything forever, which is true. Um, but this next trick, which is still played today, which I fell for that, that almost killed me, um, that I still hear talked about in the clinical setting, I still hear chatted about on the message boards. Uh, and the fact that CF, uh, and I always try to tread lightly because I can offend doctors when I say this. We always hear CF is a progressive disease, right? CF is a progressive disease. It may be, but I can tell you what patience here is. When you start pounding that message, CF is progressive, CF is progressive, CF is progressive. You know what I heard? Well, I'm progressively getting worse, so you know what, they were right. CF is a progressive disease. But now there's nothing I can do about it because it's progressive. And it's gonna get progressively worse. And that's what I think so many patients, the trick they fall for now, is that no matter, once they start getting sicker, either a little sicker or a lot sicker, they say, you know what, this is it. I give up. Because it's a progressive disease, so that means it can only get progressively worse. And what's the point of changing anything? What's the point of working hard if it's just gonna get worse? And that's where I was. That's where I found myself. Um, eventually, I was resigned to the fact 
that I was just kind of on this earth occupying space until I died. I was still very happy. I was still very social. People still wanted to be around me. I wasn't a hermit, you know, holed up in my, in my house. But I just simply accepted the fact that, you know what, this must be my time. My friends are dying. Again, most of them weren't making great choices. Parents, I think we, right, we kind of, sometimes we fool ourselves and we say, well, all of my kids, all of my kids' friends aren't making good choices, but he is. Um, I surrounded myself with a bunch of people who made bad choices, CF and not CF. And, and that's what I was doing. Uh, and I was going down this track of progressive CF thinking there's no way this train is going to stop. And certainly, I don't have the power to do anything. I mean, it's CF, right? It's out of my control. Uh, and I got tricked into thinking that it was CF uh, that was getting worse and worse. Uh, when in reality, it was my actions, and it was my attitude, and it was my approach to life, uh, and how many treatments I did, uh, and how, how uh, active and proactive I was uh, with exercise. Uh, and, you know, I was never, like I said, I was never depressed or uh, in a dark place. or I, I mean, I was happy to die. I was welcoming it. Because uh, at this point, my life was so affected. Uh, the way that I was breathing and the amount of blood I was coughing up uh, and the amount of days I was in the hospital. At this point, I was in the hospital every three months for 30 days. Every year. And so I would spend a quarter of my life in the hospital. And then the other 75%, I couldn't breathe that well. Um, so at some points, again, I, I, I was never uh, saying, oh, I wish I would die. But I didn't run from it. Uh, because that's not the life that I wanted to live. Uh, but at that point, again, I still thought it was CF that was the problem. Uh, and. And I think that as a community, we still have this issue uh, because we make everything about CF and what CF does and how CF affects me or how CF affects you. But rarely do I see, what am I doing? What's my, what is my contribution to how I feel? Because honestly, and, 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 and people without CF can understand it, Sometimes personal responsibility and accountability is like a dirty word. And we feel bad when somebody calls us out on our own actions of what we contributed, whether it's in the workplace, on the athletic field, uh, in life in general, right? We always have a, a response, a defense mechanism of, no, 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 it's, it's because of this. And rarely are we willing to just step back and go, OK, let's make sure I'm doing everything right, and then we can figure out maybe what truly is out of my control, or who, whose fault it is. Um, but I think that's because we, again, we, we, we get pounded as a community into that CF is this progressive, unrelenting, terrible disease that you can't do anything about. And it's just simply not true. Is it true for some people? Yes. But they are in the minority. Most of us can push against this train. Some of us are able to push it the other way. And instead of CF becoming progressively bad, uh, it may become progressively better. Um, and so how this played out in my own life. I was in China um, in 2008. Uh, my, uh, I started dating a, a girl um, June 27th, 2008, and this girl was all right. There was, uh, there was something different about her. Um, I, I knew early that I didn't want her just to be another six to eight weeker, um, that I wanted her ar around for a little bit. And uh, her dad and her mom happened to live in Shanghai, China for, for work. And so, uh, we all went out there for New Year's, um, the 2008 over to 2009 New Year. 
and uh, things were great. Again, at this time, my, my uh, baseline, which I could do a whole other talk about, my baseline lung function was around 60% uh, FEV1. So in, in the eight years that I was making terrible decisions, I went from 120% to about 60%. Um, and, and, and again, I think it's important to point out, it's because I didn't abandon everything. I, I still did treatments 65% of the time, 70% uh, of the time. Uh, I still, I had an active job. I coached football. So I was still, I, I was still active somewhat. I still lifted weights. Uh, I still did uh, intramural sports. Uh, so I think those are the things that actually kept me alive. Um, but certainly having your lung function chop, chopped in half wasn't ideal. Uh, and like I said, the, the hospital days increased, uh, coughing up blood increased, everything got worse. But um, so I'm in China and everybody gets uh, upper respiratory uh, sickness uh, that was going around, some virus. And I actually didn't get it for the first couple days. Um, but then it hit me like a, a load of bricks. And um, by day four, uh, I was coughing up, um, one night I, I would have filled up two of these, at least two of these cups of pure blood. Um, I was coughing up into this, I mean I could barely stand, I was dizzy obviously. Uh, and at that point I thought, you know what, this is it. Because if I go to a Chinese hospital, I will die. Um, uh, because as we saw, you know, one in 100,000 Asian, Asians uh, have CF. Uh, and, and so they're not very privy on, on uh, how to treat it. And so I was just thinking at that point, man, I just, I have to get back to the States. Um, fortunately, uh, our flight was only like two days away. Um, so of course, what did we do? We traveled up to the Great Wall and um, I'm, I'm watching the group walk the Great Wall while I'm literally hanging on to the Great Wall. Uh, and, and I was, I've never felt so terrible. On the flight home, uh, my girlfriend would nudge me about every 15 minutes because she didn't know if I was sleeping or if I had passed out and lost consciousness. Uh, both were happening. Um, uh, we get back to Phoenix. Uh, I make another brilliant decision and I drive myself down to Tucson. Uh, I don't remember any of the trip. Um, I get to the ER. Uh, many of my friends at that time worked in ER. Some girls I dated worked in ER. They knew me and they took one look at me and said, how are you walking? My lips were blue, my nails were blue, my skin had a blue hue, gray hue. I mean, I looked like death walking. Uh, sure enough, they did my sat, my oxygen saturation. It was fluctuating, you know, high 60s, low 70s. Uh, I was, I was jibber-jabbering. I wasn't making sense when I was talking. Uh, and so I immediately got rushed up to ICU. Uh, they threatened to intubate me, um, which I resisted. Uh, at this point, I'd had enough friends that uh, uh, got intubated. And, and the last conversation I ever had with them was before they got intubated. And so I made the personal decision that if I was going to go, it was going to be with my eyes closed or eyes open, knowing what was going on. And um, the, the biggest reason that I wanted to stay with it was so I could apologize to my mom when she came. At that moment, the only thing I felt was shame. Um, because that's when it started sinking in that I was an idiot. Uh, and I knew that if, if I was intubated, that could be it. It's not always it, certainly. Um, but for me, I was convinced that would be it. And I just wanted to hang on long enough to apologize. And I can't tell you what a terrible feeling that was. Um, they threatened intubation for what seemed like days. Um, I was put on BiPAP. If any of you are familiar with BiPAP, uh, it's a mask you wear, goes over your nose and mouth, and it forces air into your lungs. Uh, in many respects, it acts like an IPV 
uh, but it's always on you and it just, it, it, it really makes breathing easier and it expands your lungs. Um, I was in ICU, oh, and I guess I should point out, so, so we don't think that I'm uh, exaggerating the story to make the effect better, uh, nurses were coming up from other floors to say goodbye and, and telling me all these things they liked about me, which is kind of cool. But um, <laughs> they, people around me were convinced that was it. They had seen enough of this to know that was it. Uh, fortunately, I spent a week in ICU and then I got moved to the general floor. Three days later, so 10 days of treatment total, uh, I did my first PFT and I blew a 30%. Um, I was on BiPAP around the clock. Uh, I ended up being in the hospital for 52 days. 48% of them, 48%, 48 of them were with BiPAP. Um, even 48 days later, I wasn't able to hold uh, my uh, saturation to the level that they wanted to see. Uh, but again, it kind of uh, miraculously, by day 52, I was very stable. Uh, I was ready, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget uh, the day I was discharged, uh, Dr. Brown, who, who he's at my wedding, uh, I mean, he is, I consider him a friend, came into my room, I had just blown a 50%, um, and, and he said to me, you know, <clears throat> Ronnie, I'll, I'll be completely honest, M most people we get in here in that position don't survive. So you need to consider yourself blessed. Consider yourself lucky. Um, and I know you're a competitor. And uh, I know this won't be pleasant to hear, but I've always been honest with you. The fact that you blew a 50%, we're thrilled with. And I don't want you to beat yourself up too much by getting back to your old baseline of 60. Uh, if you get to 55, you know, we'll throw you a party. Um, and, you know, I've never asked him, but I'm almost positive that he was just trying to yank my chain because he knew that it would motivate me, and it did. Um, I went into the bathroom just before I left, and, and, and this isn't a made-for-TV movie, but I literally looked into the mirror, and I said, Ronnie, you are an idiot, and you're going to change. It is no longer about what makes me comfortable. Uh, it is no longer about what I want to do, um, and, it's, and it's not cystic fibrosis. It's you. Uh, and so that day I made the decision that my health was going to come first, no matter what. Uh, and... Um, I left the hospital that day. Uh, I still didn't look great, uh, believe me. Um, but like I said, I decided from that point forward, I was gonna do four treatment sets a day, every day. I was gonna exercise, some form of exercise, every day. And I wasn't gonna delay hospital stays um, um, if I could help it at all. Uh, and so, that day or that week, I decided to take up running, which was one of the worst decisions ever because I hate it. <laughs> um, but it helped save, prolong, and make my life better. And I and I and I think what happens is, you know, we're we're sick, uh, we don't feel good, our lung function isn't great, and and we start to believe that. Uh, we're going to have to feel better before we start exercising. Um, which, I, I have this and I, I make the point that people don't lose weight to go on to the biggest loser. Right? If anything, you should try to gain weight before you go on. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I still see people uh, tricked, and certainly I was before this wake up call, that I'm just too sick to exercise. There's no way I can get it done. But exercise is a vehicle by which we can become healthier. Uh, certainly it can be better if doctors is doctor monitored, you know, to make sure nothing else is going on. Um, but uh, if there's one secret, 
And I'm so glad that he highlighted it. Man, exercise is the key. Exercise is the best medicine. You can find a study involving exercise in every body system that we have. Every one. Uh, skin, mental health, liver, kidneys, lungs, digestion, sleep, energy. I mean, exercise is like this magical pill. But you have to take it. And you have to do it. I, I, I won't make anybody raise their hand in this room who doesn't exercise consistently, but you're making a mistake. And not only are you making a mistake for you personally and possibly shortening your life, but you're not setting a good example for your children. Uh, the best thing you can do for your children is leave an, lead an active life. Show them that your health is important. And if you feel that your health's important, just maybe they'll feel that their health's important. I mean, how do we learn everything? Everything's modeled for us. That's how we learn everything we do. Uh, and I can tell you, and I've said this already multiple times to people I've met during this trip, behind almost every active, well-adjusted, healthy CF patient are active, well-adjusted, healthy CF parents. It's not true every time, but most times it is. And if and if you have this attitude that CF sucks and CF you know, affects his family negatively and CF this, CF that, and your child grows up to be depressed and nobody wants to be around him, you had a big role in that. We have to watch how we talk around our kids about something that's not going away. We have to learn how to teach them to embrace it. And I can tell you another thing that sports does, right, is confidence. Uh, or exercising is confidence. Uh, how, did, how did it now, you know, it sustained me my first uh, 20 years of life. Then I started making my own awesome choices. Uh, it didn't include exercise daily. Uh, and uh, when I left the hospital that day, I told Dr. Brown, I will blow a 75% FEV1 again. I don't care what I have to do. Uh, which he kind of snickered because I hadn't blown that since 2003. And since you have some progressive disease that always gets worse, it didn't look so good. Uh, it took me uh, 18 months um, to run a f my first mile. Um, and it took, I think, 24 or so to blow a 75%. Uh, I did four treatments a day, every day. I exercised every day. There was just simply no excuses. Uh, and so I've seen it work in my own life. You know, and, and one, of the, one of the little props I bring are a pair of dice because I hear people still say, well, you know, Ronnie's just lucky. Uh, he, he, it, it, they almost discount how hard I work. And, and I can tell you, does some of it have to do with luck? Maybe. But it's funny because the harder I work, the luckier I get, <laughs> the healthier I get. I've sustained through exercise and treatments a 75%. Currently, I'm not that. I can tell you, in the last, since I got out of the hospital the last time in December, before that I was in seven months prior, that's the longest stretch I've been out of the hospital in 10 years. I got comfortable. Uh, I started taking days off of exercising and just going and walking on a treadmill for two hours. Uh, I'm going into the hospital on Friday. It's only been, for me, it's been just over four months. And I don't think at all it has anything to do with CF. It's because I got comfortable. I started not putting my health first. And I'm paying the price. I don't feel great. Um, uh, but again, uh, we have to attach hard work, making good choices, putting your health first with positive outcomes. Because that's usually what happens. I can't promise you it's going to happen every time, but it's going to give your child, it's going to give you the best chance. I'll start wrapping it up, sorry. OK. Last two. Uh, 
the other thing that a lot of teens face, uh, college age, after college, and again, uh, I fell for this trick, uh, is that I started to think, and I think the reason, uh, I was actually a psychology major in college, and I think that helped me kind of realize a lot of these things, uh, but the reason that I um, was so social and, and, and kind of never committed to one person uh, was because I felt kind of unlovable. And not that I didn't think I was a good guy, uh, but I started to think to myself, if I really loved somebody, why would I allow them to be part of this life? Going into the hospital every 30 days, attached to a neb, attached to a vest, coughing up blood, uh, coughing up mucus, uh, and then kissing me. I mean, come on, that doesn't sound appealing. Uh, and so I kind of as a defense mechanism, I decided that kind of long-term relationships weren't for me. Uh, it started actually change with uh, the girl that uh, I broke up with on June 20th, 2008. Um, again, I, I met a real special girl seven days later, uh, which I wasn't planning on. Uh, but, but Mandy, my now wife, who I went to China with, uh, who stayed by my side when I was literally dying, who um, is the greatest woman I've ever known, has cemented the fact and drives home the point that CF has made me the man that she fell in love with and that she sees all of the great things that CF has molded me into. And we don't know who I'd be without CF, but we know who I am with it, and she loves that guy. And, and uh, I think it goes back to allowing CF to, to form you. Uh, I can tell you I'm one of those cheesy guys that pulls over on the side of the road to admire a sunset. Um, Sugar, I'm almost positive, tastes sweeter to me than it will you. And I do appreciate the small things. I value family uh, more than anything else. And, and I don't know if that would be the case without this disease. Uh, but I have a wife who loves me, and, and I have a daughter who thinks I'm pretty, pretty rad. Um, and uh, I, I think that one of the best things that I did if, if people online are watching, is I allowed somebody to come in. I allowed somebody to know all the dirty stuff that comes with CF. I was very open with, this is what you're getting into. Uh, and I had a girl uh, who thankfully was also hot that said, you know what, I want to be a part of that. <laughs> uh, and, and finally, uh, the last trick, um, this is an ultrasound of my daughter who now is two and a half. She's not much bigger, by the way. Um, and, you know, I, I don't bring this around to say uh, that uh, having children uh, is everybody's uh, life's goal, life's dream. Uh, but I can tell you that growing up, I was always told uh, to not dream that, that having children was impossible. Um, for me. I was tested, and I am in the 95% of guys who can't conceive uh, children the, the old natural way. Um, uh, but even before I knew that, I was told point blank that I wouldn't be a dad. I, and I knew as a youngster that's what I wanted to do. Um, uh, and through the miracle of IVF, um, we welcomed McKenna into this world. Uh, October 17th at 12.44 a.m., which, by the way, is 44 minutes after my wife's birthday ended. And so I know she held on to have her own birthday. <laughs> um, uh, but the point here is, if anybody's going to tell your children that something's impossible, please don't let it be you. Let it be somebody else. You need to make sure you're your child's cheerleader, their supporter. You're the person doing whatever's possible to make it a reality. Uh, because if you, we have something that, again, is not going away, that we feel is taking something from our lives, it's not going to be a pleasant